Hello, I'm Brian Humphreys, Director of Communication for Autonomous Systems and Advanced Programs at Northrop Grumman. 197 million square miles. That's the area of the world's surface. That's an awful lot of land and sea to monitor, a task that was impossible before the advent of high altitude, long endurance autonomous systems. With me today to discuss the value of high altitude, long endurance autonomous systems is Bill Beck, Director of Autonomous Programs at Northrop Grumman. So just for those in the audience who aren't familiar with Northrop Grumman's um, hail portfolio, can you perhaps just give a, a bit of a description on the size of a typical hail uh, platform, uh, its endurance and its altitude and, and some of the missions that it would typically do in a military environment for both land and sea. Sure. So hail, it's, it's really above, it's in the high 40s to 60,000 feet of, of altitude. Uh, to get up there, you, you need a relatively large plane. Uh, what we're talking about with uh, the, the hail systems that, that we have worked on and, and are working on, Wingspans are well over 100 feet, 130 feet plus. Uh, this allows you to, to get aloft and, and to stay there for, uh, let's talk about endurance in terms of a day, 24 hours to 30 hours or, or, or longer. Now this is all the while being able to put significant power uh, onto sensors and traveling at relatively high speeds. Can you describe some of the autonomy that underpins Northrop Grumman's hail unmanned systems? Oh, that's a great, great question. And there, there are a number of uh, discriminators, if you will. First of which is that being hail, you're, you're flying very high. And, and there's a number of reasons we can get into it as to why you want to fly high. But the big deal is, or a big deal is, that uh, flying high means that you, you can stay up longer. So you have much greater range and, and endurance flying high. Uh, the second is that these are large vehicles small drones by any means. They're, they're carrying large sensors, which uh, has uh, its own capability, uh, its own discriminator fuel. But to do that, you generate a fair amount of power required to, uh, to uh, keep those sensors alive and, and the environmental control. So the size of the vehicle does matter. The third thing would be the, um, the, the fact that if these are long endurance, you, you, you need to be reliable very reliable if you're going to be out there for 20, 30 hours at a time. And then of course back to the core which is autonomy. These aren't fly by uh, a joystick. This is pre-program it, send it out and, and uh, maybe modify it as, it as it goes. So let's take a little bit of time to talk about the difference between a hail UAS or high altitude long endurance unmanned system that Northrop Grumman's responsible for and some of the smaller systems that folks may have seen on the news or in the movies. So Northrop's autonomous process or approach to uh, hail systems and, and UAVs in general, well, unmanned systems in general, is to make them autonomous. So this really means, it, in a simplified way, a pilot that's not in the loop, but he's on the loop. So a pilot in the loop would be one that pilot that is literally stick and rudder. He's taking the plane off, he's making the maneuvers, he's uh, controlling the sensors, uh, all, all as part of um, that kind of joystick approach to, uh, to driving that system. A pilot on the loop is where a pilot can intervene, but we have pre-programmed and we have algorithms that'll take this system purely autonomously into a full-on mission. Now, things happen in a mission and a pilot needs to override or mission plans need to be adjusted, that, that can be done. But truly, this could go from start to finish of a mission completely uh, on its own pre-programmed. Let's talk for a minute about why we're focusing on high altitude, long endurance. Let's come back to those 197 million square miles. How does altitude help us monitor wide area? Oh yeah, that's, that's great. I, I mean, altitude is, is really everything. So you, you go to altitude for a number of reasons, one of which is, of course, uh, thinner air up there. You can, you can fly longer, fly faster, and it's the right place to be from uh, an aerosciences perspective. And there's the horizon. You can see for, and, and why? Because you have big powerful sensors on it. So going back to the issue of size. The larger the sensor, the further you can see. Uh, going up high, you have a, a much larger horizon. And of course, the comms that go with it. The line of sight communications on this, being up higher, has the same sort of horizon. 
What about long endurance? Why does endurance um, assist us as we try to monitor wide areas? Yeah, endurance is truly, uh, it, 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 it's, it's everything. Um, when it comes to doing ISR, you're, you're really, I won't say competing against satellites, but you, the, the ultimate is to be considered a deployable satellite where you're going out and you're there staring. You're staring indefinitely, 24-7. Uh, you're, you're just looking at what needs to be looked at and, and perhaps following it. So having uh, the, the legs, if you will, uh, the endurance to do that, big deal. And uh, being reliable enough to stay out there, big deal. What's the category for high altitude? So uh, another, uh, you're bringing up another point about what really discriminates medium versus high. In, in my uh, vernacular, high altitude is above where commercial traffic is. It, it's something in the uh, upper 40 to 50, 60,000 feet. So that's what we consider high. You're above most of the weather, and you're above most of the commercial traffic. So things are much more easy, uh, much easier to uh, contain and monitor. So above the weather, is that clouds or is that things like the jet streams? Well, the jet stream does, does go pretty high. You've got winds aloft for sure, but, but being able to avoid those things that uh, uh, are less predictable, the, the thunderstorms, the icy, the lightning. Uh, you might be survivable in those things, but why, why put yourself in harm's way, so to speak? But staying above the weather is key. And, and you talk about winds aloft. Well, having the speed to begin with, with a, a larger plane, says that you're going to make good headway regardless of what you're what are some of the challenges uh, when it comes to operating high altitude, long endurance systems uh, in a maritime environment? Yeah, maritime environments are, are tricky. Uh, the, the first, first um, challenge, if you will, is the fact that you, you, the comms, uh, the satellite coverage over, over the water isn't necessarily as good as it is in populated areas. So you're, you're dealing with bandwidth. And, and that leads to a lot of other decisions that need to be made and, and, and work that needs to be done to make sure that the right data uh, can get home in a timely manner. Second is that it is pure surveillance. You're not in enemy territory, so to speak, or looking into it as a standoff. You're gonna encounter things that you, you, you don't know about yet. You're, you're truly doing surveillance. You're gonna come up across maritime traffic in a 360 degree sort of environment. Back in 2001, when Northrop Grumman's uh, advanced concept technology demonstrator of a Hale UAS flew from Edwards Air Force Base in California to Australia. Um, so what are some of the changes between a, a, a Hale system designed for overland surveillance versus one that's optimised for maritime surveillance? So two major differences are right off the top uh, is to understand that the sensors, all of which need to, to be able to look 360 degrees, so what you found with the original program we referred to, that was a side-looking radar and side-looking telescope or EOIR. If you look at a maritime application, you, you, you want those sensors to have 360-degree field of uh, view and regard. The, the second would be the, the type of satellite coverage, uh, the bands that, that would be utilized, as opposed to the, the more common KU and X and KA systems that, that support uh, overseas. In 2018, the United States came out with a new national defence strategy. Um, in large part, um, it pointed to the importance of acting as a joint force. So having Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Space Force, all working collaboratively as a joint force. How can HAIL, High Altitude Long Endurance Unmanned Systems, including those developed by Northrop Grumman, help with that joint force construct? Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, it's definitely where things are headed, and, and first of all, being interoperable. So making sure that you have the right comms and networks that you're connected into, that they're universal, and, and you're not some sort of unique, uh, alone and unafraid asset out there. The second is really to behave not like a, a platform out there, but truly as a node. And what I mean by that is that you actually are doing some processing. So it's not that you're taking pictures of, of a lot of blue water that has no meaning uh, or no interest to anyone. You're, you're really able to, to go into that, um, that, that footage, if you will, or, or a radar imagery 
and pick out what's important, understand what might be important to somebody. And that's really where AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning come is to understand what's important and who is it important for. So that's really where, where I believe things will be headed in the future. There's advances in AI and all that, that, that really help to get the right data to the right people. So the HAIL systems that we've been talking about have been designed for a military purpose. Right? They're, um, being in the, they're, they're obviously being utilized by air forces and, and, and navies. Um, but how do they support civilian uh, tasks? As we would say in a, in a government environment, support to the civilian power. So how do they help uh, um, in that environment? It's, it's, there, there are a, a number of, of great applications over the years that, that we've seen come out of our system. Monitoring fire, uh, whether it be in uh, stateside, uh, in, in what we're seeing now in the, on the West Coast, uh, some great successes in terms of understanding where the hot spots are and, uh, and bringing that down in, in, in a real time manner. Second would be uh, tsunamis, uh, the big Indonesian tsunami. Uh, there was a lot of great footage. The Indonesian tsunami was, a, was a, uh, an application where uh, we were able to go and, and see the, the entire affected uh, coastline and report on those uh, uh, key situations. Uh, what happened in Haiti with the, um, uh, the weather events there, uh, real-time data to show where need was and how, how you can move or maneuver through clogged uh, bridges and arteries and such to get uh, help to the right people. So these hail systems are, are true national security assets? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it, it, goes, it goes beyond that. Uh, let's talk about illegal fishing and, and, and some of those things that I know. Australia, for example, has great fisheries and, and they're, they're very difficult to monitor. But here's where persistence really makes a difference in the sense that you're able to put a camera on, uh, on a vessel with nets down, nets up, while you're waiting for a surface asset to go and engage them and see exactly what's been happening. Mm -hmm. And can they come down from altitude if necessary? They can, and, that, and that's something that has been put into, a lot of thought has been put into maritime systems. How often might you need to come down and, and, and to do that, what, what would you have to do? The, the big one is flying through commercial airspace. The second is flying through weather. So being able to uh, endure lightning uh, and, and uh, icing conditions. But from an airspace integration standpoint, you know, hail being above the, uh, the airspace is one thing. In dipping down, it now needs uh, to be able to fly with due regard for others. Uh, sense and avoid system is, is really the next step in autonomy that, that we have been working on. Let's talk a little bit about that, ne those next steps. So obviously, these hail unmanned systems are already incredibly advanced. Where might that technology go in the next uh, decade or two? Autonomy will go for, for hail systems. We'll, we'll be being able to understand some, some of the problem spots that you get into and how to get out of it. For example, if you're in commercial airspace and you have an intruder coming in, pilot on the loop, being able to take control and, and maneuver according to FAA regs uh, in a prescribed way. Or if, if perhaps you have a comms out, having the system autonomously be able to do the same thing. So uh, advances for autonomy I see happening in, in areas that really depend on AI artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, and in, in, in my mind, the, the, the big advantage for an ISR system uh, that will be brought on by uh, autonomous operations in the IML is being able to realize over habits, perhaps, who is looking for what type of data. Well, uh, that's a, it's a fascinating topic. And thank you very much for your time today, Bill. And thank you for, uh, for watching.